Figured we could use a little soothing music here about this point, uh, this topic. Uh, that's Ends of the Earth from a group called Lord Huron. Beautiful stuff. They're out of uh, Los Angeles, and uh, I've got that, that album. It came out in 2012. It's really beautiful. We're talking with David Yonke about his book, Sin, Shame, and Secrets, about this horrible murder of a Catholic nun uh, back in 1980. The chief suspect quickly becomes the priest is it possible this priest uh, just did this in a fit of rage? I mean, how unusual would it be for a priest to murder a nun, and even more unusual for that priest to be allegedly involved with a secret devil-worshipping cult? We're going to get into what evidence points in that direction right after this on Coast to Coast AM. David, uh, back in 1980, when this terrible murder occurred, I mean, you know, there are stories and whispers about priests and the things that they do with altar boys, stuff that we now sort of take for granted because there have been so many cases that have been have come forward. But back then, it, it wasn't uh, sort of on, on everyone's lips at the time. They didn't know how uh, the, the, the extent of the terrible things that have been done behind the scenes, right? That's right, George. Um, there was a, a, a reverence for priests that was you know, that put them on a pedestal, as the old cliche goes, but um, they just, the priests were, you know, beyond reproach, and uh, I talked to many victims of uh, clerical abuse who, who, you know, these grown men who were telling me about, you know, their stories and how they were molested or raped, and um, they had no one to tell because they were children. They would tell their parents. One one, uh, man told me when he went to his mom and told her what this priest had done to her, to him, uh, she slapped him in the face and said, don't ever talk about father like that. So um, there was just this this feeling that priests were not uh, capable of falling into any kind of sin or temptation. And as you tell us in this book, I mean, there was a lot of it going on in Toledo. There were a lot of cases where it comes out years later that priests did terrible things to a lot of, of, of kids. Yeah, it, it was terrible, and, uh, you know, I started uh, working on that right after the uh, Boston uh, scandal erupted, and that, that was the first one uh, to kind of send shockwaves across the country. And, um, you know, I went to the uh, to the Toledo bishop, and he kind of downplayed it, said, you know, there were only two cases of abuse in Toledo's history, and both of those priests are dead. Well, I wrote a story, you know, quoting him on that, you know, the next day, and I started getting calls from people, you know, saying he's lying. I was a victim, you know. So, I mean, the fact that when the, when the bishop said that, it kind of uh, rallied the troops and everybody who had been victimized and felt like, you know, they were never uh, uh, never had a chance to tell the truth. They they started uh, uh, contacting the media. So it it really opened the doors or opened the floodgates, I guess you could say, because there were several dozen. Uh, cases that were settled in Toledo in the long run that were uh, settled out of court. And, and you and other reporters who've worked on this started to see a pattern that they not only does the church uh, not admit the wrongdoing, but does its best to bury it. And at least in Toledo, the police went along with it. A lot of instances that you mentioned about that they could have pursued a couple of guys for these things and just they got a pass. Yeah, there was uh, one time this uh, one of the more notorious abusers uh, was was confronted by uh, one of the victim's parents, and uh, uh, the police went to the bishop and said, you know, either you get this priest out of here, or you know, we're going to take care of it. So the next day he was gone, and the, you know, the per- parish was never told why he just kind of disappeared, and he ended up, of course, in another parish, and that was the basically the, the, the procedure back then. Um, you know, the, the bishop uh, told me that there was a time when they thought that these priests could go away for rehabilitation, go to a, a you know, for therapy, and maybe an in-house retreat center, and then repent, and then come back, and they would be healed. But he said, of course, you know, we learned the hard way that that's not the way it works, that these people are not treatable, that, you know, they're serial molesters. But uh, back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and even the 80s, they, they thought that um, they could be rehabilitated. Let's talk about devil worship. Uh, this allegation, uh, we'll come back to the investigation of uh, Father Robinson uh, in a minute. Um, the allegations about him being involved with satanic ritual and, and this larger group come much later, of course, years later. Do you believe it? Uh, do, you be- do you believe that there is uh, merit to that? 
Well, unfortunately, I, I do. You know, I, I try as a reporter, you know, I try to uh, be fair and objective, but, you know, my personal opinion is that, you know, there's just too much uh, smoke where there has to be some fire there. And, uh, um, you know, a lot of it has to do with the testimony of, an, of another uh, Toledo nun who kind of raised this whole uh, case back into the, you know, into the public attention by going to the diocese and testifying uh, to the review board, which uh, that's kind of a long story in itself, but uh, there was a nun who said that she had been abused as a child by a satanic cult, and Father Robinson was one of the priests in that cult, and she had some horrific uh, uh, allegations. And, and um, so she's believable to me. Uh, I've interviewed her, and I know her, and I, I believe that she's telling the truth. And then the diocese appointed two veteran uh, policemen, detectives, to investigate her claims. And uh, one of them told me, uh, you know, and this guy is like a retired policeman with 40 years uh, of law enforcement experience. He said he believes her. So um, I think, you know, that kind of led me to, uh, to, to believe her story. I mean, the, the, the idea that a Catholic priest is secretly a Satan worshiper that he's part of a group of people who had done unspeakable things to children, to animals, uh, these rituals, sexual abuse, um, threats. Uh, it, I mean, the picture you paint in your book is pretty bad. I mean, it, and it's much more than just this one priest. Yes, it's it's very disturbing. Um, but, you know, this uh, this Catholic priest, uh, Father Jeffrey Grob, who's an, an, an exorcist uh, for the Archdiocese of Chicago, he said that, you know, priests are no different than any other men, and they are susceptible to, to temptation. There are satanic cults out there, so he said you cannot rule out the fact that, you know, a priest could be capable of doing something like that, as, as bizarre and, and disturbing as it is. Let's talk for a few minutes about the investigation. It, you, as you noted, uh, it quickly focused on Gerald Robinson, and they haul him in April 18th and 19th. He, they do a couple of interviews with him. They hook him up to a polygraph, and some really weird things happen uh, during the course of, the, of, of their interaction with him. Tell me about that. Oh, well, um, he failed the first polygraph, and then they asked for, uh, his lawyers asked for a second one in a, and he did, and, and he passed that one, but they, you know, it was kind of a qualified success because the polygraph administrator said that, you know, it was, uh, um, wasn't very convincing, but he barely, you know, he, he passed that one. But um, in addition to that, the detectives uh, um, were interrogating him in, in the police uh, station, which they call the safety building here in Toledo, and uh, we're preparing for, a, this was the second interrogation of Robinson. And Well, let's go back to the, fir the first time they interrogated him. He said that uh, somebody had confessed to him that, that they had uh, killed a nun. So the detective was like, what? You know, what are you saying? And, and Robinson uh, said, well, yeah, he said, somebody came up to me and confessed. And uh, Detective Art Mark said, well, who was it? And he goes, well, I can't say. He goes, well, was it a male or female? And he said, I can't say. And then Robinson said, well, uh, nobody really, nobody confessed. I just, I just made that up. So um, that was kind of shocking in itself that, um, you know. That he As was, if that wouldn't put him, I mean, you know, if you're the detective investigating it, the main suspect says, okay, somebody else admitted it to me. And then he says, I just made that up. I mean, if that doesn't convince you this guy has got something to hide, I don't know what would. Right. That's right. And then... Um, the next time they, they well they went to his apartment and they found a letter opener that uh, later you know that they believed was a murder weapon, um, which is a, another story in itself. But during that uh, they went back to the police station to interrogate him and they were uh, expecting another like eight hour, ten hour in, uh, interrogation. An hour into it, uh, they get interrupted by the deputy police chief. Um, a, Catholic Church Monsignor and a lawyer, they knock on the door, they uh, they take Robinson out, and they walk away with him. And uh, the detectives that were doing the, uh, you know, the interrogation were just, you know, astonished because they said, you never, ever interrupt a police interrogation. But that was, um, that was basically the end of the, uh, of what they could do to, to investigate Robinson at that time. He, and so the, the end result is no one gets charged. 
Nothing That's happens. Right. That's right. And, um, you know, that, that letter opener that was found, in, it was found in his locked apartment in the hospital, and uh, it was a, a nine-inch uh, sword-shaped, saber-shaped letter opener. And um, as time revealed uh, later on, it was a perfect match for the uh, wounds in Sister Margaret Ann's body. Now, looking back on it, uh, if, if you've spent so many years covering this, looking back on it, um, was it a cover-up, or as the the some of the prosecutors and lawmen have said since, yeah, we always thought he was the guy. We just didn't have enough evidence to take it to trial. What do you think? Um, well, let's put it this way: the the deputy police chief uh, Ray Vetter was, um, you know, a devout Catholic, and um, the prosecutor at the time, Tony Paisa, was a devout Catholic. So. Um, Deputy Chief Vetter went to Paisa to talk about the case, and they said, no, there's not enough evidence, you know, so we're not going to convict, so we're not going to arrest him, because if you, if you can't convict, then there's no sense charging him. Um, you know, the, the detectives that were investigating it said that they thought there was plenty of evidence to uh, arrest and charge Robinson. So um, it just seems to me like um, they didn't want to charge him. It was part of that culture at the time, you know, they... They felt like they wanted to protect the church and protect the image of the church, and it would have been quite a shock to you know to arrest a priest and charge him with murdering a nun. As you mentioned, uh, this officer, Davidson, who retired, he wouldn't let go of it. He kept pushing it and trying to investigate it, and he got some pressure. People thought he was writing a book. That was one, one part of what reopened it. And then secondly, as you mentioned, June 2003, this uh, former nun comes forward and says, hey, I was abused for years, ritual sex abuse by a, a bunch of devil worshipers, and one of them was Gerald Robinson. And so the church takes a look at that, and suddenly... There's a, a new life for this investigation. Right. Um, it was, it was um, what, 23 years after, after the nun was murdered, and uh, just by uh, chance, this other nun in Toledo, who in the first edition of the book I didn't identify her, but she, um, I used a pseudonym, but in the new edition I do use her name because she had come forward after that and been in the news, so... Um, you know, she's she's okay with it now to, to say who she was. But she was raised in a family that um, was in the cult, and her father and her mother were part of it. And so she had nowhere to go. I mean, she couldn't, you know, she couldn't escape their clutches. So she she um, had been uh, undergone you know, horrible uh, torture and, and sexual abuse and psychological abuse. And so she went to the diocese. Uh, after this whole scandal erupted with the clerical sexual abuse, and they had formed these review boards to re, to listen to victims and their allegations and decide whether they were uh, had any merit or not, because they felt like you know some of these people were just coming up with bogus claims. So she went to the diocese and testified about her abuse and um, saying that she had been in you know the uh, victim of this cult and that Father Robinson was one of the perpetrators. And when she left, uh, you know, they, all the people on the review board said they don't believe her. But um, one of the people on the on the board was not a Catholic. He's a psychologist. And he said, look, he said, this nun says that the cult killed children. And, uh, you know, there's no statutes of limitations for murder. So, and they, the cult may still be active. So I believe that we should report this to the authorities and let them investigate it. We're not investigators. We're not, you know, law enforcement. So... Uh, there was a big uh, dispute on the review board, and they pr tried to pressure uh, Dr. Cooley uh, not to take it to the authorities. He he got letters from uh, the diocese lawyers, kind of uh, implying that he could lose his license if he uh, violates the confidentiality of the of the nun and all this. And so he ended up uh, he did take her written testimony to the Ohio Attorney General. He went outside of Toledo to to go to. Uh, law enforcement that was not part of the Toledo uh, machine, I guess you could say. And um, that led to them, uh, they sent it back to the Toledo cold case squad and said, you know, you should look into this. And so uh, the nun's testimony to the diocese ended up reopening the case. And so it's a new generation of investigators, prosecutors. The power of the church is not quite what it was once before. And because of advances in DNA and other kinds of technology, they were able to open a case, take it to trial. 
and you sat in every day of the trial, right? Exactly, yeah. And I, I was there um, actually for the jury selection, which was quite interesting because, um, you know, there was a number of, of people that were questioned that said they, they just could never convict a priest. They don't care what the evidence was. They just don't think a priest is capable of such a crime. So, uh, you know, there was still that uh, prevailing uh, reverence uh, for priests, at least among some of the some of the people that were potential or prospective jurors. So how convincing was the case? Um, well, you know, I, when, I, when, the tr- when the trial started, I mean, before, as soon as the priest was arrested, the judge put a gag order so nobody could talk to the media. So I went in there with, you know, some background information as much as I could get, but really not knowing what the evidence was. And, and so I, I kind of felt like I was the 13th juror, and, you know, let's see what, what we can see. And I felt like they, they proved it beyond a shadow of a doubt that um, Father Robinson was the killer, and um, if I was on the jury, I would have, you know, I would have had to say he was guilty. And was it DNA evidence that was most convincing? Well, you know, George, that that's another good question because it was not DNA, um, oh. and most uh, cold case investigations hinge on DNA. But the key to this is the murder occurred in 1980, and DNA was not used as a forensic tool until about 1985. So, you know, when the nun was killed, I mean, she was in a hospital, and the room, the sacristy, was just uh, inundated with people that were trying to help her. There was doctors and nurses and, you know, technicians and all these people, police, and they they did not preserve the crime scene for DNA purposes. So it was, I guess you would say it was contaminated, and and DNA was not really uh, a big factor in this uh, particular trial. It was the weapon then, the the, the murder weapon, the, the yeah. letter opener. Yeah, the, the one of the key things was the the letter opener, which was really an unusual shape. It was not like a, a a typical letter opener that you think of, you know, with a flat blade. This one had a four sided blade, and if you looked at it head on, it would look kind of like a kite shape. And uh, it was long, and it had a curved blade. It had a uh, a handle with a ribbed handle. It had a knuckle guard on it, so it looked like a miniature saber, and um, it had a distinctive shape. And um, uh, one of the detectives tried to find uh, another one like it and was unable to. He said he went on eBay. He went to letter opener clubs. And he said, surprisingly, there are clubs where you know people collect letter openers and. And, uh, you know, there had to be more than one of these made, but they're they're pretty rare. And it was uh, from uh, um, a wax museum in uh, Washington, D.C., and it had a, an emblem of the U.S. Capitol on one side of it, and on the other side of the handle it had uh, two pentagrams, uh, huh. two five-sided stars. So it was a distinctive shape uh, letter opener. It was in the priest's. Uh, locked apartment, and when the police took it for um, testing, the uh, uh, the lab expert said, you know, this this letter opener is sumptuously clean. It was his words. He said there was no fingerprints on the whole thing. So um, they tested it for the presence of blood. They, they put some phenosaline on it, and uh, they couldn't find any results. But when they pried off this medallion and then tested it. They found uh, it lit up for the presence, possible presence of blood under the medallion. So apparently it had been, you know, scrub clean, but there was just a, a hint that there might have been some blood on it at one time. And so that was that was a big part of it. The shape of it, uh, you know, there were blood um, pattern transfers on the altar cloth and and uh, on some of the uh, the nuns' clothing that matched perfectly the shape of the letter opener. Well, as you note in the book, Sin, Shame, and Secrets, it did not take the jury very long to reach a verdict. Uh, When we come back, uh, talk a little bit about that. I'll open up the phone lines with a couple of questions for you. And then I want to ask you about what you call the satanic panic, because there were other allegations about satanic groups operating in Ohio uh, in the same general time frame. And I'm kind of curious if uh, this father was part of a cult, what happened to the rest of them? Much more to come here on Coast to Coast AM song is called California Stars, this version uh, by Bob Seeker from his new album, Ride Out. It's a great song, written in the 1930s by the great Woody Guthrie. Long time ago. You ought to check that uh, album out. We're talking with David Yonke about his 
book, Sin, Shame, and Secrets, a gripping account of murder, the conviction of a priest, and then a subsequent cover-up by police and uh, the church. And when we come back, I want to find out a little bit about whether or not the the other members of this cult might still be out there lurking around. And uh, we'll also open up the phone lines with a couple of your questions for my guests. Much more to come here on Coast to Coast AM. David Yonke, as I said at the beginning of the program, I, I think your book, Sin, Shame, and Secrets, is is a terrific piece of work, really solid on your part, but so disturbing on, on several levels. I mean, as you note, uh, this father, uh, Robinson, was convicted. He went to prison. But even to the end, as, as recently as uh, less than a year ago, uh, he had supporters. He's still wearing a collar. I'm sure probably people still call him father. Um, and you, you have no doubt at all that, that this guy was guilty, right? Yeah, he, when he, you know, he was in prison uh, the last eight years of his life, but uh, even in prison they called him father, and I guess he, you know, he, he had been banned from ministry, so he couldn't uh, present himself as a priest to the public, uh, but he was never defrocked or laicized. So the difference is, you know, he's still a priest in in. Uh, uh, in in the uh, eyes of the church, but he just uh, he was limited in what he, how he could uh, serve it. But you know he was considered uh, you know by the fellow inmates to be their their priest. I guess they would tell him confessions and things like that. So um, yeah, I, I don't know why the Vatican never uh, laicized him. I wrote to him, I emailed him, I tried to get some questions about that. Uh, uh, but I never even got a response. So um, I, I know I sent it to the right person, but I think they just chose to uh, to avoid answering, you know, because, uh, you know, they, they lay aside priests for abusing children, but they don't do it for a priest who murdered a nun. It just didn't make any sense to me. I mean, you'd like to think with all the scandals that the church has reformed, has made enough changes where it can be more open about handling these kind of things and addressing it and not sweeping it under the rug. But what's your feeling on it? Yeah. Um, um, well, I I think they just didn't want to deal with uh, uh, you know with Father Robinson. I mean, they'd, they'd rather just he was elderly, and I think they just thought you know the church is kind of slow to act in a lot of ways anyway. So I think they were just kind of letting it ride and and hoping uh, that would be the end of it. You know, he did have a, a series of uh, legal appeals. He went through all the way to you know through the Ohio Supreme Court and then to the U.S. Supreme Court and. You know, they all upheld the, the guilty verdict. So, um, and then they started another round of appeals, and, um, and that was in process at the time that he died. So, um, you know, he 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 really had a lot of support from lawyers who were willing to uh, you know serve uh, pro bono to help his case, and and a lot of Toledoans, um, especially the Polish Catholics in Toledo just refuse to accept the fact that he's guilty. But, you know, I'm not surprised. It's, you know, there, there's a sense of loyalty to a priest, and, and especially the old-school Catholics, and it still kind of prevails here in some ways. Yeah, there's a section in the book where you write about what was called the Satanic Panic in the mid-'80s, uh, which is, you know, a couple of years after the this terrible murder, where there were allegations about... Um, ritual murders and the cops went looking for bodies and they found indications that there really was another another cult or a cult that was operating and and uh i just wonder what your feeling is about the cult that this father was part of i mean the 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 nun's testimony suggested that her own parents were involved that there were i think in one instance she saw a, a bunch of bodies hanging on meat hooks yeah. That, that there were murders. Anything ever come of any of that? Are there? Is this cult still out there somewhere? Or what, what's your feeling? Well, that's probably the most disturbing part of this whole story. Is that you know the, there's this cult could still be in operation. There, there's it's so shadowy and and uh, hard to pin down. I know that you know these these veteran grizzled detectives uh, looked into it and you know they they believe that there was a cult that was responsible for the. Uh, for what you know, what the nun had testified to, they thought it really did happen, um, but they, you know, they never could get you know the, the kind of evidence or proof that they could go to court with. So um, I, I'm not sure what to say, George. I mean, I, it, it's kind of the underbelly of society. Uh, you know, they 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 are very good at uh, uh, keeping a low profile and avoiding uh, you know avoiding any kind of uh, confrontations with law enforcement. 
But, you know, this satanic panic in 85, the sheriff said that he had reasonable uh, um, uh, witnesses that told him that there was going to be a sacrifice on the uh, uh, equinox on June 21st, and so he was um, determined to prevent that murder. But he said they were, you know, that the Lucas County Sheriff believed that there were an average of five murders a year for at least 15 years with this cult, and so he had bulldozers and heavy equipment uh, moved, you know, uh, digging up the earth and uh, never really found any evidence of it, though. But he said, you know, based on reliable witnesses and people that had seen the murders, um, he believed that there really was a cult operating in this uh, country country part of uh, Ohio. I'll take a call and a couple of calls in a second here. I wanted to mention one other thing before we go to the phones. There was a quote uh, toward your end of your book where somebody uh, from the church, I think, says, "Well, the fa- you know, because the father Robinson died uh, about a year ago." And somebody said he's in a better place now, and I'm not sure. That, I'm not sure anybody can make that assumption. You know where where he ended up. Um, there, there's a point in the that kind of gave me goosebumps in your book where you talk about the funeral services, the mass for Sister Margaret. That there were some weather events that happened around, and almost like uh, the the heavens were angry or something. Yes, um, you know, the number of people that were there told me that, you know, and it, during the Mass, it was just a big storm came up out of nowhere. It had not been predicted by the weathermen or anything. It just shook the building so hard that they thought the roof was going to blow off. And, you know, the doors of the chapel blew open and some leaves came skittering across the floor down the aisle. And it was just such a sudden burst and, you know, such a, a fierce storm that they just felt like uh, as... Sister Margaret Ann's uh, nephew, uh, Lee Paul, told me, you know, he felt like, you know, God was just uh, showing his wrath at, at this horrible crime. Wow, that's that's uh, <laughs> that's kind of chilling. We'll take a couple of phone calls. East of the Rockies, Emma in Baltimore. You're on with David Yonke. Hi, Emma. Hi. I, uh, first of all, hope the um, author will spell his last name. And um, I recall reading in the Washington Post, I can't remember, it's some time back, about a case exactly as he described it at Georgetown University Hospital. Um, that's, uh, you know, right next to Georgetown University in the movie The Exorcist, where the priest gets thrown down the steps. This is the, the hospital. Um, do you know about that case? Uh, no, I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with that one. And my name is last name is Yonke, Y O N K E. Um, but obviously, uh, you know, Toledo is not the only place that has problems with satanic cults or allegations of satanic cults. So I'm not surprised. Uh, Emma, thank you for the call. Yeah, his name is David Yonke, Y O N K E. The book is Sin, Shame, and Secrets, and we have a link to that. If you'd like to check it out, I highly recommend it. It's a it's a great read, disturbing but uh, but really gripping. Uh, we're going to go wild card Sharon in Winnipeg, Canada. Uh, hi, Sharon. You're on with David. Oh, hi. Thank you. Um, I I want to first of all just thank David for for writing this book. I think as a uh, actually, it's interesting you mentioned uh, Polish Catholics. My mother and father uh, were both Polish Catholics, but I was not baptized uh, um, as a baby. I'm, I'm in the process, actually, right now of becoming uh, Catholic. So uh, to hear this is really to hear this is quite up- upsetting. But at the same time, I'm so grateful for the nun that stepped forward. Um, um, and the psychiatrist who doggedly uh, was determined to, uh, you know, reopen the case. And my question is, David, the person that you accessed, uh, the priest who was an exorcist, do you think this priest, I don't even want to call him a priest, but do you think he was possessed? Um, I don't think he was possessed, but he was definitely, uh, you know, a a strange character. Um, but maybe at the time of the murder, maybe he was. Uh, you know, that's that's something that I really can't say. But you know, he was um, hanging out with uh, uh, you know some bad people, and and you know the crime was horrific. And I I would like to say though that you know you're you're going to be a Catholic. Uh, you know, I give you uh, credit for that. And I just wanted to point out that most priests are really good people. You know, 98 percent of them statistically have never been faced and charged with anything. So. You know, there's a few bad apples, and 
Father Robinson's one of the worst bad apples, but I don't I don't mean to disparage the entire church. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you, for, uh, thank you, Sharon, for the call. We're going to go west of the Rockies, Mario in Tijuana, Mexico. Hi, Mario. You're on with David. Good evening, gentlemen. Hey, good shout out from Tijuana here. I got to air this out. Uh, I remember reading in a book in Sonoma that uh, this went back to 16th century France. A whole bunch of people. There was lots of evidence, where you never would have heard about it. It certainly would have made a lot of day with the power Catholic Church had back then, especially that the Queen even was in charge and was investigated for murder of infants and drinking their blood, along with priests. They were doing uh, ritual backward masses, the, the satanic masses, in the church. And they had some kind of uh, underground chamber where they are doing this stuff. And they were investigated, but all, most of them got off, of course, there was so much power for the church. And I just wanted to contend that the Catholic Church has always been a great foil for satan- Satanists, because it's a perfect place to hide. You've got access to people for victims. And you got a perfect cover. It's a beautiful situation for them. It attracts them. Yeah, it's a magnet. You know the uh, the prosecutors. Uh, in the end, they they thought it was just too much for some people to believe that a Catholic priest could be in a satanic cult. So while they talked about that during the trial, when it came to the closing arguments, they kind of played down that theory and just went with a, a different motive. So it's interesting that you know the Catholic Church. Uh, um, you know, it just doesn't seem likely that a priest could do something like that, but yet, you know, the evidence points to it. Mario, thanks for the call. So so in the trial, they emphasized more that he just didn't like women. He didn't like being bossed around by women rather than the uh, devil worship stuff. Right. You know, the prosecutors uh, debated within, you know, their own group, like whether to pursue that because it was so, so far out. And, you know, it has to be a unanimous verdict, and there's 12 jurors, and they, they, you know, told me off the record, or I mean, after, you know, away from the trial, after the trial, that they just felt like, you know, if one of them just holds out and says, "I don't believe a priest could be in a satanic cult," that would, you know, that would ruin their prosecution. So they decided at that point to just emphasize his anger and his his hatred of women, and and say, you know, he didn't want to be at the hospital, and so he just kind of lost it. And they said it was a mundane. Uh, uh, mundane motive, just a man angry at a woman. We have a call from Debbie in Toledo on the East of the Rockies line. She says she was in this hospital, in the in the Mercy Hospital, a year after the murder happened. Debbie, thanks for calling in. You're on with David. Hi. Um, sorry if I'm kind of shaky with this, but this is like a, a really, really a very stressful thing for me that living here in the city and dealing with this situation for years and listening to uh, um, everything. But I I remember having my my son um, in that hospital um, just about a year, year and a half after this, and um, I just remember being just scared to death with just of the just knowing that this had happened there, and even though it had been like a year and a half before, um, just it, it was – it was just horrible. I mean, I, I couldn't sleep at night. And, and then just about two miles from where I live, there was a, a, a set of, like, um, apartments connected together. And there was um, a, a young woman who had a lot of evidence that she wanted to bring forth um, against this man. And it, it, it her place mysteriously, like, burned to the ground I mean, there's been so many things that have have come out that I don't know how far in the news across the country it hit. But within this city, you know, you hear more things than what you will, you know, um, outside of it. And it's just been very, very disturbing. And this has got to be the most vile, sickest thing that I can even think of that anybody could do to a child, you know, or, or an animal, you know, somebody vulnerable and innocent. And it's just disturbed me so, so bad all these years. I mean, I, I still have shakes about it. And I really wasn't going to listen to this program tonight when, you know, you had said what you were going to talk about. I thought, I, no, no, I can't deal with this. And they happened to come in the kitchen and turn it on and talking about this. I'm going, oh, my God, could they be talking about Toledo? And then you said it, and I'm like, this this is this is this is unreal. I've I've got to get in. I've got to I've got to call on this. And 
I can just remember seeing pictures of this man in the paper, and his in his eyes, he had no soul in his eyes. I mean, his eyes were just black as can be. And how people just have thought, you know, he was innocent and just rallied around him. I mean, there were a lot who who didn't and, you know, tried to bring evidence, you know, towards him and just... I, I, it, it just sickens me, you know, the cover well, up of this and the things you know, that been at that could when be you going on. And the people. Debbie, let's let David get in here for a second. Uh, uh, David, go ahead. When you were at the hospital with, to have your your child, uh, there was the murderer was he was still on the loose. They didn't know, who, you know, was never arrested for twenty four years. So I can see why you were upset, and I can see why you're, you know you're still upset today. It's a very disturbing case. I think this happened in your own city. Well, David, would he still have been at the hospital? Would the Father Robinson had still been there when Debbie was there? Um, no, I believe he was transferred. Yeah, he was transferred uh, to a parish, I believe, shortly after that. He was like an associate pastor. So, Debbie, I, yeah, Debbie, I suspect there's a lot of people who don't want to hear it, don't want to talk about it, who've, who were not directly involved but who were deeply affected by it. I feel yeah, bad for people that were married by him, you know, or their children were baptized by him. They, a oh. couple of them have asked me, what do I do now? You know, my, the priest that married us is, is, a, is a murderer. So I, that's a tough one. Debbie, you a know, final but, comment? Was, was walking around for years just free, and it, it, it's just it's just the most sickening, evil thing that is just, and the people associated with this, it's covered it up. It's like, you know, they will have their judgment day before when they stand before God, and there won't be any mercy for these people. I, I, I just, it just, it's, it's very, very disturbing to me. And after all of these years, and um, I, I will never forget that experience and just not being able to sleep at all and just, be, just watch in my room with at the end of the hall right near the doors, that go into the elevators, and it was just... It, Debbie, thank you for the call. We appreciate you sharing your feelings with us. I should mention, David, in the book, you quote one of the witnesses who saw the father there when he supposedly wasn't anywhere near uh, the murder scene. One of the witnesses who saw him leaving that general area said that he encountered him, I think, in a hallway, and that this guy gave him a look that shot right through him. Right. He was a doctor. Well, he became a doctor. He was uh, an intern there, but... Yeah, uh, there were three people that saw him near the scene of the murder, near the chapel, around the time of the murder. So he had, you know, told police that he never left his room until later in the in the morning. But yet, that was a big part of the uh, the evidence against him was that three separate witnesses had seen him near the chapel. You know, the Catholic Church pretty powerful back then, still pretty powerful today. How are you uh, in in regard to them? Did they come after you? Did they pressure you? Any um, problems? No, you know, really none except, uh, you know, maybe a couple of dirty looks from, from people. But I did a lot of book signings, and I was kind of surprised that most of the people that bought the book and had positive comments were Catholic and said they just were glad to finally hear what really happened, and, you know, they weren't getting it from the church. And so, uh, you know, it took a, uh, an investigative reporter to, to get to the, to the heart of the story. So they were what? very grateful. And a lot of them told me they were buying this book for their parents for Christmas, and I thought, oh, my goodness, what? <laughs> Are you going to keep your parents up all night, you know, with nightmares with this book? Well, it's like it's not an indictment necessarily of the church or the faith. It's, uh, you know, it's humans, priests, nuns, they're humans. They, they exactly. get caught up in stuff. They make mistakes. Uh, David, thank you very much. David Yonke, the book is uh, Sin, Shame, and Secrets. Uh, I enjoyed it. It's disturbing, but it's a great read. Thanks for joining us. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you so much, George. All right. We'll have you back again then. Thank you. Uh, Bill Scott coming up next uh, to talk about uh, his latest work. It has nothing to do with secret planes or secret bases. This is something much more personal. Stay with us. John Lennon takes us into the break here on Coast to Coast AM.